and joining us now on the debate in New York, New York, Peter Beinert, senior political writer at The Daily Beast. And joining us here in studio, Chris Alexander, former Canadian ambassador to Afghanistan. And once again, we welcome back Janice Stein, TVO's foreign affairs analyst and the director at the Monk School of Global Affairs. Peter, good to see you on the line from New York City and nice to have you two in the studio. Chris, first time on the program, long overdue, nice to have you here. I want to start by reading, we referenced off the top of the program that democracies have a pretty good record when it comes to fighting wars. And here's some more uh, on that from two university professors at Emory and Dartmouth who wrote in Democracies at War. Since 1815, democracies have won more than three quarters of the wars in which they have participated. This is cause for cheer among Democrats. It would appear that democratic nations not only might enjoy the good life of peace, prosperity and freedom, they can also defend themselves against outside threats from tyrants and despots. So let's get into this. Peter Barnett, to you first. Why have democracies, do you think, uh, been so historically successful at waging war? Well, I think democracy has just proved a good organizational tool for society in general. Uh, and I think that manifests itself in, in terms of uh, fighting wars when you think about your ability to mobilize the population, no mobilize economic resources. Um, democracies are probably a little bit less likely than dictatorships to, to go to war under foolish circumstances. Not to say they never do that, but that it's a little bit it's a little harder to take the war, country to war on the whim of one person like in a dictatorship. And that may also prevent them from some of the more foolish, aggressive wars sometimes that, that dictatorships have undertaken. Janice, any theories on that? You know, I actually think there's something wrong with the data. You know, honestly. Okay. You're going to reject the premise. I'm going to reject, you reject the premise. reject the allegation and the alligator. That's right. I think if you, it's the way the data are partitioned. If you look, and so if you start in 1815 and go through right to 1945 or so, it would be true. If we actually looked at the, 20 half, the second half of the 20th century, probably wouldn't be so because the kind of all out total war that democracies fought, both in World War I and World War II, we haven't fought those kinds of wars really mm -hmm. since. Um, and you look at the Korean War, you look at the war in Vietnam, and many others that I could go along that don't have clear endings to them and certainly don't have clear victories. Uh, I think this is a dubious proposition as we move closer and closer to the present. Well, let me and there's good up. reason for that, too. Sure. Let me pick up, uh, Chris, for you from the sort of second half of the 20th century where Janice wants to uh, start the clock again. Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, I mean, we, the list could go on. Democracies, it would seem, are no longer as effective as, say, they once were, if you go by the second half of the 20th century, at waging war. Has war ceased to be an effective tool to get what you want politically? It's changing. Uh, I think that has to be the answer. The nature of war is changing. Uh, as the number of democracies increases, the tendency to have wars between or among democracies or inside democracies, true democracies, mm -hmm. uh, is less. That's proven you know, in, in other statistics. Um, and yes, the capacity to project wars, to project military force far away to distant lands like Vietnam or even Korea in the 50s, uh, Afghanistan now more recently, uh, is, is in question. Not everyone wants to do it. Not everyone can afford to do it. Uh, and so it's done more selectively. Um, it's done not always for the same kind of objective, you know, the survival of our society. Mm -hmm. uh, it's often done to protect the human rights of other people. And people at home don't always agree that their rights or their well-being matters as much as ours. Hmm. Peter, when you look at the track record in the second half of the 20th century, the first decade of the 21st century, do you want to come to the conclusion that war has ceased to be as effective a means for pursuing political objectives as it once was? I don't think the line is quite as clear as that. I mean, if we had been talking here in the late 1970s, uh, in the wake of Vietnam, I think we would have all agreed, and there was a very common assertion in American foreign policy thinking in the 1970s, in the wake of Vietnam, that, that military action had lost its utility. Um, then you had Grenada in 83, which was a victory, Panama in 1989, which was a victory, the Gulf War in 91, which was a victory, Bosnia in 95, Kosovo in 99. So, I mean, the, we're in the, which produced a much, much greater optimism about the utility of military force. In retrospect, far too much optimism. And now I think we've come back to a moment which is more like the 1970s, in which people are much more pessimistic. Um, whether that, I think that pessimism will probably last in the United States for quite a while, you know, for 15 years after Vietnam, the U.S. was very reluctant to use military force. And it will partly depend on whether American resources return in such a way that war is again 
we can pay for it. But I, I think it would be too it would be too easy, too early to simply say that essentially uh, the current fatigue that exists in the United States will, will last forever and ever. It's a good thing we've got an international relations professor here because I need reminding on who said, was it von Clausewitz who said, you know, war is politics by other means? It's, it, you're absolutely it right, it was. So, uh, you know, the other means don't seem to be as clear cut or as successful these days as it was in his day. You see, following off from Peter's comment, I, I think the crucial distinction is what's at stake. Um, and how does the public in a democracy understand what's at stake? So when the public really feels that their security is threatened, um, and we've had part of that obviously in the first decade of the 21st century, if the public feels that it's their own security that's at stake, democracies are extremely effective at mobilizing political support, even when the going is very tough. When the public begins to feel, no, 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 it's not about that. It's about somebody else's human rights, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's about women. Uh, girls it's going to school, the right to fly a kite. School. It's about nation building. It's about any or all of those things. Mm -hmm. And it's far away, and it's prolonged, and there's no clear end to this. That's when you get what I call deep democratic fatigue. And once that sets in, I, it is a decade or more now, again, with the caveat that should the public perceive a direct threat, if they think their own country in any democracy, that their own country is threatened and insecure, public opinion turns. Well, you must get that, I mean, you, from your time in Afghanistan, uh, you know, I, I guess people are asking themselves, how is it possible that World War II, we defeated the Nazis, six we years. defeated the Japanese Empire in six years, and 10 years later, we're still in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. we can't take care of the Taliban. Now, it's, it's reasonable for people to ask those questions and whether or not democracies can still get the job done, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, conventional war versus counterinsurgency, mm -hmm. those are two different categories. Total war versus selective, you know, part-time war. It's, it's part-time in the sense of the public's attention mm -hmm. is only on it part-time, uh, despite the best efforts of, of many journalists and, and, and others to, uh, to achieve focus. But I think the deeper issue is this. We weren't the only ones who won the Second World War. Mm -hmm. The Soviet Union uh, fought the most decisive engagements, Moscow, Stalingrad, and so forth, that really started to bleed the, the life out of that once all-powerful Nazi army. Mm -hmm. uh, Churchill's policy was very different. A and so we ended up with a Cold War afterwards, when certain kinds of war really weren't possible. Uh, Korea was a stalemate, Vietnam perhaps a loss, uh, Afghanistan, an indirect war, a win in a sense in the a 80s. A stalemate. Yeah. Uh, but, but ultimately a stalemate and, and then mm -hmm. unintended consequences. So what are people willing to go to war for today? I would say three things. One, a serious threat to international mm -hmm. boundaries, like Kuwait, Gulf One. Two, a major large scale violation of human rights, including atrocities, mm -hmm. uh, including genocide, up to and including genocide, like Rwanda, or some of the episodes we saw in the Balkans. Uh, and then thirdly, terrorism as in the threat of non-state actors or state actors projecting asymmetric threats out against us, where we fly, where we live. Th those can achieve resonance with people. A and I would argue in the case of Afghanistan, which you mentioned, that in some sense all three are there. All three are there, yeah. Can I, uh, Peter, ask you to pick up on the journalism angle here, because you get involved in this a lot, this 24-7 news cycle we're in, constant political polling, constant punditry. Uh, maintain, for, for governments, for democracies nowadays, to maintain the so-called consent of the governed over a lengthy period of time. Is that one of the reasons, which is hard to do obviously, is that one of the reasons why democracies may find it more difficult to prosecute and win wars these days? Well, um, I think you have to counterbalance that against, in the United States case, the enormous powers of the presidency. I mean, the, the president, uh, with the pres you, know, you saw this with the Bush administration, I mean, the United States by 2005, certainly 2006, had really decisively turned against the war in Iraq. Um, and George W. Bush simply said, no, we're going to send more troops to Iraq. Um, and there wasn't very much that Congress could do about it. I mean, they could have tried to defund the war, but that was a kind of a nuclear option that they were, many people were worried about taking. And I think so there is some evidence that actually a determined president can sustain uh, a war for a significant amount of time, not indefinitely, but for a significant amount of time, 
in the teeth of public opinion. If he's prepared to put up with, uh, you know, single digit or, or maybe approval ratings in the teens, that's the other thing. <laughs> Yes, you're going to pay it. You're going to pay a political price for it, absolutely. But in fact, we've seen that presidents have, in fact, been willing to do that historically. Janice, you know, it's it's, it's interesting because the other side of the coin is, um, what do presidents or prime ministers, for that matter, tell their publics about the reasons for going to war? And if you actually look back at the ones that were not successful, at the ones that the public turned against, it's usually because the political leadership at the top has had a whole host of confusing reasons. Um, and vacillate with one story or another story. There's no clear, coherent narrative that um, political leaders stick to. They don't level with the public at the beginning and say, this is a long fight. This is not a year or two. We're not going to renew this mandate for two years and then extend it for another year. We're talking about 10 years, 15 years, uh, and you need to have a long time horizon. We're going to have casualties. I think for me, looking at it, the biggest single failure of political leaders in a democracy is to level with the public right from the beginning and set reasonable expectations. Well, let me follow up with you on that then, Chris. John McCain said during the last presidential election campaign, we may be in Afghanistan for 100 years. Look, we've been in Germany for whatever, 60, 65. Yeah, Korea. At Korea for, yeah, since yeah. the end of 19, middle, middle 1950s. He was killed for saying that, absolutely killed. So Jenna says you've got to level with the public and let them know we're in this for the long haul. But if you do, incidentally, we're going to cut your political head off. Sure. But 100 years is a bit long. I, I mean, I, I, even, even in a worst case scenario. I, I admire McCain on Afghanistan because he has a feel for military conflict, as if you know, having served in the military. And a lot of politicians don't have that direct sense of what it's like, what it might take, and how important it is to show determination politically so that the military can do their thing on the ground. I mean, Afghanistan is, is, is a classic case because in the first few years, uh, yes, the will was shown to topple top the Taliban, not, but not really to do anything else. Dismantle the Taliban after they moved to Pakistan, rebuild Afghanistan, so we really only started to see that in that will shown in 2008. A few decisions, late decisions, by the Bush administration, but mostly the arrival of President Obama and his team. And um, you know, why did they do it? Because in a democracy, there is a feedback mechanism. The, 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 the story that had been told about Afghanistan being fine in 2005, 2006, was blown wide open, shown to be not the case. And the whole US political uh, apparatus was mobilized to deliver a new level of determination. We've, we haven't seen that before in other wars, uh, and I think it's remarkable. Let me follow up with Peter on this then, and I'm going to read you something, Peter, that the Canadian press reported uh, earlier this month. A leading Afghan broadcaster says militants smell victory in his country because the West is gradually turning its back on the war-torn nation. Saad Mosseini, director of the Moby Media Group, offered that sober assessment at the opening at the Halifax International Security Forum, which you were at, Janice, yes. weren't you? He says divisions within NATO, the international community, and the United States are making Afghans nervous about the future of their country. Does that speak, Peter, to a lack of will among democracies to kind of finish what they started? Yes, there is that lack of will. And I, but I, you know, the reason that presidents, you could have told, one of the things that Franklin Roosevelt, I think, understood, um, and one of the reasons that I think that he was reluctant to bring the United States into, the, into war, into World War II, until Pearl Harbor, is he wanted the threat to the United States to be so overwhelming and palpable that he would be able to ask virtually unlimited sacrifice from the American people. The reason that politicians are not honest about the costs of war in Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, or Vietnam for that matter, is the threat is not so direct that the public is willing to basically do whatever it takes. And that, in a, particularly in an environment where we've not had in the United States, or really anywhere around the world, another terrorist attack on the scale of 9-11, that's the environment that, under, that, under, that underlies the political reality in Afghanistan. That said, even though American public opinion is declining, uh, public will to fight the war is declining, I think it's even more true in many of America's allies, the reality is that if President Obama decides he wants to maintain U.S. troop levels at, you know, U.S. troop presence at this level in Afghanistan um, for the next two, three, four, I think even, even well into his, into his second term, uh, and, and David Petraeus wants to do it, I think they'll actually be able to do it. There will be a political cost 
But I think actually, if Obama wants to show the will, I'm not saying it would be a good idea, I think he'll actually be able to carry it off. Janice. Yeah, you know, there's another factor that we haven't really talked about, uh, which is very important in any debate about democracy and war, and it speaks to, this, to Peter's argument that Obama could sustain this over four years. The draft. Uh, if you have a draft army in a democracy, you have a level of public interest and public engagement. And I think you remember uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, that took place when there was, in fact, a draft army in the United States. And well, sort of, unless well, you were a Republican and yes. then you got a deferment. Yes, there were, there were, okay. or you were a graduate student, you got a deferment Which too, Which mostly frankly. Republicans, but okay. Um, but there was, therefore, so there was a, a very short leash on an administration, and I, if the results were ambiguous, and people couldn't see progress, and people didn't understand the purpose, the leash on any president is extremely short on any prime minister. We don't have now in the Western world, most, I mean, Germany just finally abandoned um, its draft-like army. These are professional armies, removed by one degree of separation from the public. Uh, so as long as you're able to maintain a fundamentally radio silence about what's happening, the public goes away for long periods of time. I still maintain that we undersell the public. I don't think John McCain got, John McCain got killed when he made that statement because it was a kind of, um, it was so exaggerated, a hundred years. If John McCain had made a statement, this is a tough war, we have an interest in being there, here's the interest, and I can't tell you whether this will be 10 years or 15 exactly. years, he would not have gotten killed, Steve. So I reject that argument. I think the real trouble comes when the public sniffs in democracies that their leaders are not leveling with them. Have they been sniffing that here? Well, I think, I think oh, yeah, they have. Some in, degree. in different countries at different stages. You know, there are several European countries that have lost governments yep. over Afghanistan. And some of those governments have come back with different policies. Uh, in Canada at various stages, under both liberals and conservatives. We've either oversold or undersold the importance of the mission for various reasons. Uh, but uh, I think Janice is absolutely right. There's a feedback mechanism. The, the public, public makes, the truth comes out in a free and democratic society and the, the public makes its view known. But there's something important here, Steve, that deserves to be mentioned alongside. Uh, the wars of today aren't wars of just total mobilization and putting the largest army into the field right. the way Roosevelt had to do it and Churchill. They are wars where the objectives are limited, the, the contingent sent is limited and tailored, uh, but you, you win, you have success, not with the group you sent at the beginning, but with a totally different set of tools. It's a game of adaptation. And democracies do adapt, the US system sometimes dramatically and quickly, but when you have NATO and a multilateral effort involving 40 plus countries, uh, there's lessons learned being shared all across those armies, those units, and between civil, civil and military actors. And that is a powerful weapon. When the history of Afghanistan is written, I think you'll see the initiative on different issues passed through a lot of different hands. You know, just to jump in very quickly, um, Peter, you, you may not be watching Canadian politics with the degree of interest and, uh, I think and, we can confirm and that. passion <laughs> that the rest of us watch, but <laughs> <laughs> our Minister of Defense just uh, fundamentally, for all intents and purposes, announced uh, two days ago that we would be sent, keeping about 750 uh, soldiers in Afghanistan for another three years. Um, for training purposes with 200 support troops. Where's the public outcry? You don't hear it, right? So that gives the why, in a sense, to this notion that the government has, in, in democracy, has such limited room for, now we didn't get a lot of details on what that mission is gonna look like. But is Who, that because we don't have a draft? If we had a draft, you'd be a lot more It's because we don't have a draft. I think mm -hmm. that's the big difference in, 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 in democratic wars of the kind we now fight. They are fought by professional armies. Mm -hmm. And our vulnerability in this country, and I believe in the United States as well, comes because we're pulling on reserves who are in fact embedded in civilian life. And that's the pressure point that governments are really feeling. It's not from the professional army who actually want to go and want to stay. Hmm. Peter, with these there's wars, all right, go ahead, Peter, sorry. There's another, there's another pressure point, because wars are not only about blood, they're also about treasure. And although I agree with Janice that, um, that without a draft, um, 
the, the costs in terms of lives uh, don't, uh, don't have as deep an impact on society. That's one of the reasons that Richard Nixon, when he wanted to sustain the war in Vietnam after getting elected, basically turned it from a ground war into an air war because he knew it would be more sustainable. There was also the cost in, in, in treasure. And you know, one of the reasons that the U.S. was forced out of Vietnam was the increasingly serious financial uh, problems that the United States was Absolutely. facing and the way the Vietnam War was undermining America's position in the global economy. And so that's going to be another potential push. The, cr the f fiscal constraints in the United States are going to be crushing in the years to come. And they will force people to look more seriously at the defense budget, which will make them look more seriously at the amount of money we're spending in Afghanistan. You can already see that a little bit with the Tea Party. It's interesting, the Tea Partiers don't really have a position on the war in Afghanistan, but they're very, very concerned about debt. And the smarter ones amongst them will eventually realize that you can't deal with that without looking at the defense budget, which will bring them to Afghanistan through the back door. But Chris? it could lead to two things uh, in the United States. I agree the fiscal reckoning is coming. It could lead to a loss of determination to finish the job in Afghanistan, or it could lead to a reprioritization of U.S. commitments. Uh, look at the U.K., even after drastic cuts. David Richards is still saying, we'll do whatever it takes for as long as it takes. And they're not going to expand their effort, but their effort is substantial, even for a country of their size. Well, actually, I agree with Peter uh, rather than with you, Chris, on this one, because uh, the, the financial rubber really does hit the road. And it hits the road in, in a number of interesting ways. One, the absolute numbers of what it costs. And when a country is struggling um, and there is a unemployment problem and people feel very pessimistic about their economic future. They, the numbers that it costs to keep an expeditionary force in Afghanistan, play very loudly in a democratic country, number one. Number two, it's going to crunch defense spending in Canada, Britain, and the United States. We're going to have a thousand soldiers in Afghanistan. That means that we are some things we are not going to be able to buy. And that's a divisive. Uh, within the armed forces and the broader community of people who watch these issues. Although not necessarily the population as, but a, as a whole. But not necessarily the population as a whole. So actually, when financial times are difficult, um, there is, again, in democracies as opposed to other kinds of societies that just move money across budgets with a great deal of ease, there, that shortens the leash in a democracy. Chris, let me it get you to does. comment on this here. Uh, this, this is a, um, a graphic we're going to put up here from Jason Lyle, who's uh, with Yale University. Mm -hmm. And he says, to date, a near consensus exists among scholars, policymakers, and journalists around the belief that democracies are uniquely deficient when fighting counterinsurgency campaigns. It's commonly argued, for example, that democratic publics are cost intolerant and highly casualty sensitive, especially if the war turns protracted. Is the problem today is not that democracies aren't good at wars, but they're not good at the kind of wars that we happen to be fighting these days? I think that's true of some democracies and some parts of our democracy. Uh, you know, through this Cold War period when not a lot of conventional or counterinsurgency wars were fought, uh, everyone lost their ability to do it. You know, journalists lost the ability to cover it. Armies lost the ability to prosecute it. Politicians lost the ability to, to sell it. Uh, some of that has been regained now, but not completely. Um, and those martial virtues, you know, the idea that going in a disciplined way to a faraway place to protect territory or populations has a direct impact on your, uh, on your well-being at home. This is martial, M-A-R-T-I-A-L, as opposed yeah, yes. to the general? Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the, martial arts. The, 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 <laughs> those were lost, but when you look at the Canadian forces and, and Canada more deeply, it was, certainly wasn't lost completely. Uh, and, and some people are bringing it back uh, and putting it at the center of, the, or more towards the center of the lives than they did before. But, uh, you know, casualties is one of the big questions. And we are right to be casualty intolerant. But not just for our own soldiers, for people on the ground. Ca counterinsurgency is one when the people on the ground agree that the expeditionary force and their government are actually effective in protecting them. And that means making fewer mistakes. It means making the r having the right number of troops on the ground, which we didn't for many years in Afghanistan, uh, not having airstrikes that go astray and so forth. So it, I think actually that scrutiny can enhance the effectiveness. But See, just before I hear from Peter on this, let me, let me point out something that we've had some folks here spending a lot of time and effort putting together a map, which will show, because you spoke of casualties, will show 
the casualties that Canadian troops have yes. suffered in Afghanistan by region of the country, and you will see, yeah. it's very well demonstrated on yes. this map of the 150 plus casualties Canada has sustained, rural Canada has sustained those uh, casualties far more significantly than urban Canada. There are two Canadas when it comes to how yeah. Canadians yeah. have fought yeah. and died in Afghanistan. Okay, Peter, doing. sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead, you wanted to weigh in. The the only other point I wanted to make is that we're talking a lot about democracies and then the, the United States and Canada and Britain as if those are synonymous. But um, I think one of the interesting things is one of, I think, the real factors that will condition the willingness of, of the United States and its Western allies to go to war in the future probably will be the sense that of, of great fiscal constraint and perhaps even to some degree national decline. Maybe things look a little bit different if you think about a democracy that is on the financial rise. I mean, let's India, for example. Are we as confident that in the next, you know, 10 or 20 years or so, if India continues to grow economically more powerful, more geopolitically powerful, that those same constraints will operate in India? Or may it not be that, as a realist might suggest, given irrespective of the fact that it's a democracy, India may start to throw its weight around in the subcontinent more um, as, its, as its economic interests grow and maybe even beyond the subcontinent and its, uh, and, and its geopolitical appetite grows. I think it's, that's, when one thinks about democracies, I think it's also worthwhile thinking about non-Western rising democracies as well. Yeah, yeah I, I agree, but you see, it's interesting, the example that Peter just gave, the, and India's defense spending is growing by leaps and bounds, frankly as it becomes a, a much stronger economic power, its defense spending has really accelerated very dramatically. But e the qu real question is not whether India will throw its weight around the subcontinent in places like Kashmir uh, or the border with China where its direct interests are at stake. The real question is will India send an expeditionary force 2,000 miles from home, mm -hmm. right, to support a, a coalition of the willing. As we have. As we have, which is the kinds of questions we're being asked now, and so that's to totally players. different. Well, and let me add, answer to that question? Well, let me add, are, let me add, just one second. Well, not? but very, very small. I mean, right. time. A couple of battalions. Yeah, but I mean, not significant in, in that sense, and it's, it has been in the past an economic gain. Let, let's add one other issue to, to counterinsurgency operations. A very, very big part of whether democratic republics our democratic countries will support these is how the war is fought. So if you look at issues of detainees, treatment of prisoners, uh, human rights, these issues are potential game changers in democratic publics. Mm -hmm. And there is a, there is a really, serious, um, really serious friction in counterinsurgency. When you're operating on the ground and you can't distinguish the enemy often, and there's certainly no uniforms, uh, and you engage in activities even in the name of protecting the local population, but you violate the rights um, of some of those people on the ground, and that blows back through journalists who are there with you, and they tell the story to a democratic public that compromises That's the troubling. integrity of the mission. Let me go back We've to Peter. We've seen it over and over. I want to go back to Peter Beinert on this because uh, earlier on in the program, you gave a list of some of the campaigns that seem to have public support and were well prosecuted. And I think you said Grenada, Panama, the first Gulf War back in 1990-91. You know, those were all, I guess, well known for being in and out quick, very definable ob right. objectives. Right. Uh, and wins, right. and therefore had great public support and reflected well on the politicians who were involved with those. Is that to say that in, in democracies now, with cable news, with the kind of mission creep that happens, those are the only campaigns that the public is going to support, because otherwise you're into something far more amorphous and, and support is inevitably, as the thing goes on, going to wane? I can only speak for the United States. I think what we learned in the 1990s in the United States is that if you are going to go for, to war for humanitarian reasons, I think uh, uh, stop genocide, uh, as in Bosnia and Kosovo, uh, essentially the public is very, very unwilling to take casualties. Bosnia and Kosovo essentially worked because they were air wars, and if, in fact, air wars where the U.S. planes flew so high in the, in the case of Kosovo that it was virtually impossible that we could be that we could be shot down. Um, if there are, if there's a sense of threat to the United States then you can, you, can ha you can go longer with greater casualties. And we're still, in the case of Afghanistan, uh, and as we were in Iraq, still kind of living off the memory of 9-11. One thing that I think may be different about the way in which Afghanistan is justified and discussed uh, 
in the United States versus in, in, in Western Europe, perhaps in Canada, is although Americans do, are, do care about human rights and women's rights in Afghanistan, the Obama administration knows very well that it would be absolutely politically unable to support the, su support the war on that basis. Its justification always goes back to 9-11. It's right. only on that basis that it can gain even 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 any significant public support for continuing to prosecute the war. And a follow-up to Chris on Afghanistan. Did you see when you were there as ambassador any strengths that the nature of our modern democracy brought to our efforts on the ground in Afghanistan? Yeah, this open debate. You know, the fact that you could <laughs> try something uh, and think it was the right thing to do, but be hammered in public opinion at home or be hammered across the table by your allies who happen to know better. Uh, or the ability of a relatively small country like Canada to step in when others were disengaging and say, no, we're going in the other direction because we think this is more important than, than, than you do, uh, and to have them several years later agree. I mean, it, it's that diversity of views that is our strength and the ability to adapt. You know, many Canadian units, American units too, British, to a lesser extent, have been in the same parts of Afghanistan for three or four tours. They know the elders. They know the terrain. They, they've learned, some of them have learned some of the language. That helps you be more credible. It doesn't mean there's any decisive result yet. But, um, but that's something democracy uniquely brings to the table. And the fact that they're there as, the volu Soviets didn't. as volunteers, professionals, right. uh, that's the key. Uh, you know, with their communities behind them, mm -hmm. and broadly, you know, their communities in Canada have been, and Canada has been. Uh, behind its troops, uh, that, that's a huge strength. You know, just to add to what Chris was just saying, the flip side of this is when you have military leaders, and there's a risk of this with General Petraeus right now, my instinct tells me, when you have military leaders making claims that things are much better, uh, that Marja was a success, right? Uh, that things are improving on the ground. And six months later, oh. those claims are refuted. Really? It's just winter. It's just, that's <laughs> right. Winter is coming, and we know what the pattern of fighting is in Afghanistan. Those claims are refuted. Uh, that's when the public becomes deeply cynical and distrusting of political leaders. So both military and political leaders in the democracy, my view is, would be well advised to claim much less yeah. and to be and to, to claim progress after the fact rather than predicting it and then disappointing the public over and over again. That to me is absolutely deadly but if for you feel public you, support. If you feel you need to continue to have public support. Level with the public. Level, level, level. With, the, level with the public. Say to the well, public, this is really hard. Let me rip a line out from a movie. <laughs> Peter, can we handle the truth? Right. I think we can. Well, the thing about Petraeus is that um, Petraeus is trying to suggest that we're making progress uh, in preparation for this December review and then ultimately with an eye towards um, next summer where there's, as you know, there's been a, a huge struggle right. inside the administration between people at the White House who want that to us to really start to withdraw some troops then and people in the military who really don't. And I think Petraeus, uh, you, I mean, I think Janice is right, Petraeus is getting out a little bit ahead of himself because he feels like if he doesn't, basically, uh, he's not going to be able to have the time. He's trying to, in his words, put time on the clock uh, in expectation that he can have greater victory, you know, greater um, support down the line. I do think that one of the things that we're facing with the war in Afghanistan, the United States and the Obama administration, is, significant, is, is a potential for significant and disturbing uh, conflict between civilians and the military. If you read Bob Woodward's book, you already see a widespread sense inside the White House that the military was being repeatedly dishonest with them and virtually insubordinate in not basically uh, adhering to Obama's wishes to keep the surge limited in various ways and a strong sense by the military, which I think is going to have long-lasting implications in the United States, that Obama's heart is not really in the war and that he's focused really particularly on the politics of this. And I think that's going to be one of the very dangerous uh, uh, currents that's going to be playing out in the U.S. in the next you know, year or so. That's not only true in the United States, of course, right? That division that you've just referenced, the division between the military and the political leaders, is true in our own country. Mm -hmm. I mean, our prime minister did not want to extend the combat mission. Um, and for strategic reasons, he could not understand what success meant, right? And part of that was over-promising. Our military leaders are absolutely convinced when you speak to them that we are making progress on the ground. And so you see this growing gulf between military leaders that are saying it's getting better, it's getting better, it's getting better, 
political leaders who become increasingly disbelieving and distressing, and over time, that is a serious legacy, frankly. Chris, our last 30 seconds here, let me ask you this. How much after the weariness the public seems to hold after Iraq and Afghanistan, will that influence future democratic governments so that they don't say, you know what, we can't handle any more of this. These kinds of conventional wars are just off the table for us now. Well, absolutely, armies, one of Canada's size that has endured, take, endured this toll of deaths and, and injuries, they have to regenerate themselves. They have to consolidate themselves, as renew themselves as institutions. Uh, and they can't be asked to do the impossible with the scale they have. So that is an objective factor going forward. But I think the real constraint is exactly what Janice just said. It's, it's the ability of politicians on the advice of military leaders to articulate clear objectives that matter to people. Well, I think there will always be a constituency for that. Let me say you three have articulated the issues well this evening. Peter Beinert in New York City, thank you so much for being thank on you. the program. Thank you. Chris Alexander, Janice Stein here in our Toronto studios. Good of you to be with us tonight as well. Pleasure.